Welcome. Uh, so this is uh, Logic Design, and uh, this is the lecture for April Fools. And I'm not going to have any April Fools jokes. I think we've got a, enough of a joke with this crazy coronavirus stuff going on. Um, okay, what I will show you uh, as sort of a humorous sideline. Uh, <clears throat> I the last few weeks I've been working on this little beauty here, um, which is a uh, which is a uh, Skittle sorter, and you can see I have my uh, have my cups at the bottom. I don't have them all put out just yet, and I have uh, three stepper motors. There's a little bin at the top where the uh, Skittles go into, and then uh, that bin has a little uh, vibrator on it that uh, that uh, helps the helps shake the Skittles down through. I haven't tightened this down and installed it, but it's kind of sitting there. And then it has a it has a little color sensor right here. The Skittles there's a little wheel that turns uh, this this stepper motor turns a, a wheel inside. You can't really see it, but it's that yellow thing in there. And the uh, the wheel turns and drops a drops a Skittle onto the uh, onto this this uh, this little. Uh, depression here with a hole in the bottom and that that has this little board right here which has a color sensor on it and so it reads uh, reads the color and then the uh, skittle uh, drops off from there and into this uh, bigger funnel there or smaller funnel I should say drops into the funnel and then it drops down to where this this uh, the bottom stepper motor which you can see uh, right there the bottom stepper motor uh, goes ahead and points this to the right cup to deliver the skittle to one of the five appropriate bins. And in addition to this, uh, there's a couple of a couple of um, a couple of, of uh, limit switches I have to install because I have to have limit switches to to know where the stepper motors are because they don't they don't have any built-in uh, position indication. Uh, they just move in fairly accurate discrete steps. Um, but you have to know kind of where you're starting. You could just power it up within a, in a given position, but I wanted to do it a little more elegantly than that. Uh, anyway, so it's still um, still a work in progress. Here are the uh, here are the here are the little um, controllers for the stepper motors. Um, four of them, little uh, little eight pin modules with a single integrated circuit that actually does the control. And it's amazing they. Uh, just these little bitty things can drive those steppers, um, and then the whole thing is run by uh, by one of the boards that we use uh, that we use in our Micro One course, uh, the little Viva board, and this is doing the color measurement and it's running all the st all the steppers. But I, I don't have it all done yet. I still have some programming to do, and some I have to install the limit switches. I have to get the uh, the limit switches wired in. I have to get the all the wires connected to the controller boards, um, but I have verified all the parts of it. I the uh, my color detection algorithm works pretty well, and uh, the controls for the uh, for the stepper motors I've worked through them and uh, they're working okay. And then I have to set up a whole bunch of power supplies because everything runs at different voltages. The steppers at one voltage, the Viva board at another voltage, the little vibrator on the top funnel at another voltage. So I have to set up some um, some power supplies, but once I get all that done, uh, it should be kind of a fun little thing. I'll show it to you when I'm done. All right. Anyway, uh, that's my mental health stuff. All right. So what we're going to do today, we're going to go through this test, and uh, so let me go ahead and um, bring that up. I'm going to shrink myself down, and I'll bring up this. Uh, so here's the test. This is the one you were supposed to have done. So hopefully you've uh, made some progress on it, and hopefully you're you're ready to go. Yeah, something like that. Okay, yeah, that's good. All right. So if we read the problem, given the truth table, write out the midterm notation uh, for f equals, uh, and so you're supposed to write out the midterm notation. Okay. So what I do to make this easy, and if you do it the way I do it, you'll probably do better than if you don't do it the way I do it. But your call. Um, anyway, I uh, 
I generally go ahead and number the rows. Start with zero. Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, and the last row is fifteen. And you can check a couple of these. The binary values ought to line up exactly with your numbers. And now this makes it easy. So I know I have one, a min term one. 3, 4, and notice this was min term. On your actual test, I might ask you to do the max terms, so don't screw this up, okay? Um, um, 6, 11, and 14. Now, just to make sure I didn't miss one, I count the ones. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Okay, there were 6 ones, so I'm going to have 6 ones on my chart. I'm not going to put in the zeros because it just makes it cluttered. All right, so here, here they are. So, so uh, oh, well, number the squares. So that's this part. Okay, so zero. Remember, you always start with zero. One, you, you flip the bottom two rows. Two, three, four, five, six, seven. Skip the, flip the right two rows. I mean, flip the right two columns. Nine. I'm sorry, uh, 8 rather, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, and you should always wind up with 15 in this square there. Okay, now it makes it easy. 1, so square 1 gets a 1, square 3 gets a 1, square 4 gets a 1, Square 6 gets a 1, square 11 gets a 1, and 14 gets a 1. So this one's fairly straightforward. So it looks like, so now now we loop the prime implicants. So yeah, this is this one was pretty straightforward. And then this one has to loop up like this. And this one has to loop over like this. And that's it. There are only groups of two. And there are no um, groups of four, no groups of one. So that's it. And then, then we should also uh, put in the zeros down here in this other chart. So... Um, Loop all the prime complements. So that's that takes care of the first problem. Second problem, put the minimum, check both SOP and POS forms of the function from the K-map above. Use a small K-map to the right to avoid clutter if you want. Note, I only want one equation, SOP or POS, but it must be the simplest. Simplest equation, circle which it is, SOP or POS. Okay, so let's put in the zeros. And we'll leave out the ones this time. So the four corners would be one. And then we have another's, and then uh, 15 is also 0, 5 and 7 are zeros, and so it looks like, so it looks like we have the four corners, Then we have this group here, and we have this group of four here. And it doesn't look like there's anything else. So three groups of four, and um, so we can go ahead and name these. We always know, in if this were PO, SOP, this would be um, uh, B prime, D prime, uh, but since it's POS, that's uh, B plus D, and then this one is, if it were SOP, it would be A, C prime, so it's A prime plus C,
and then this group of four um, would be uh, BD, but that makes it B prime plus D prime. So that's one answer. And then this one, there, so let's see how many terms we'd have to have. We have to have this group, it's essential. We have to have this group, it's essential. We have to have this group, it's essential. And we have to have this group, it's essential. So I can already see I'm going to have to have every single one of these, and they're all three they all have three variables in them. So I'm going to have four three variable terms instead of three two variable terms. So clearly the POS is simpler, and the answer is going to be F equals B plus D times A prime plus C times B prime plus D prime. And that's all there is to it. Try and get the primes right. Remember a couple of things. The SOP solution and the POS solution are not the inverse of each other. They're exactly equal to each other. If you take the inverse of the SOP solution, for instance, you, you would get a result that would be the exact opposite of the correct answer. When f was supposed to be a 1, the inverse would give you a 0. And when the f was supposed to be a 0, the inverse would give you a 1. So they clearly can't be the inverse of each other because one of them would generate the wrong f's. And in truth, they both generate the correct f. One of them, however, is simpler in this case. Not always. Sometimes they're equivalent. But in this case, one is simpler, and that was the POS. Now, just for the heck of it, I'll write the SOP solution too. But it, it, you'll notice they're not going to be the inverse of each other. So if I write the inverse, so this, this group of two, two boxes here, this three-term group, would, would be, uh, is going to be A prime, B, D prime. A prime, B, D prime. It's a SOP term. It's, a, it's an AND gate. This group of two is going to be A prime, B prime, D. This group of two is going to be C, D, B prime. So B prime, C, D, to get it in alphabetical order. And this group of two down here is going to be uh, B, C, D prime. So the correct SOP answer would be F equals A prime, B, D prime, plus B prime, C, D, plus A prime, B prime, D, plus B, C, D prime. Now, notice the if we just took this and inverted it, I would have B, D plus... Uh, Actually, I'd have, uh, sorry, I'd have B prime, D prime, plus A, C prime, plus B, D. Well, that's not this at all. They're not the same. The inverse of one of these answers is not the same. These are exactly equal. Now, if on the other hand, I, I took this up here, and I used switching algebra to convert it from SOP to POS, I would eventually get this expression and vice versa. It's a little hard to see that right off the bat, but that's how it would come out. Okay, moving on to the ROM problem. I did solve the ROM problem this morning on the uh, uh, on our help session uh, at noon, which I will do every Wednesday at noon. I'll do one next Wednesday at noon. I had 30-some-odd uh, students uh, come on. Uh, it's nice if you can get your camera working. Uh, See if you can find a, a laptop or something with a camera. See if you can find a little uh, little uh, webcam somewhere. They're pretty cheap. You can usually get them for 10 or 15 bucks. It really helps to see your smiling faces. Because then you can give a thumbs up, or you can raise your hand if you want to say something. Or you can nod your head, and I can see everybody nodding. I can see, 
I think I can see 25 screens uh, all at once. No, maybe more than that. Uh, but anyway, you can see a bunch of screens, and then it, there's a second page that you can shoot over to and see the rest of them. So uh, it really does help if you have a camera. If you don't, that's okay. It also helps if you have a mic, but if you don't, that's okay. There's a little chat window which you can type your responses in, and you can you can at least see me, see my screen, and hear what's going on. Um, but if you can participate, that's even nicer. I, I would like to have 110 students um, every help session. So uh, I do encourage you, those of you who didn't take advantage of it to go ahead and take advantage of it on uh, next week. And if there's a tremendous amount of interest, I might do another one each week, maybe two a week. Um, all right. <clears throat> so let's do this next one, which, which I did. So this is, this is a ROM. Now, there are a lot of things you can say about this problem. Um, maybe I'll move my camera over here. Uh, maybe I won't. Yeah, there are a lot of things you can say about this, this problem. Um, one of the things you can say is that uh, you sort of sh should understand uh, why, why we would use a ROM to implement a problem. And it turns out it's a very powerful way to implement a problem uh, that uses lots of, that would, that would have a lot of complex logic to implement it. Uh, but the ROM is a lot, it's a lot of hardware, uh, and, and we're not doing any, uh, when we use a ROM, we don't do any simplification. We just take the information in our truth table, and we basically map it straight over into our ROM. And um, so let's do the problem. So, the, so let's read the problem. We should always read our problems. Realize, a for, realize four switching functions using the ROM. Populate ROM cells, label outs and ins, and here are the functions. F1 is the is 1, 2, 3, 5, 13, and 15. F2 is 0, 2, 4, 6, 9, 11. And F3 is 2, 5, 9, 13, 14, 15. And F4 is 6, 7, 13, 15. All right. So, um, so first we, we extract this these shorthand notation into our truth table. So for this one, uh, and it's good to number these rows. I'll just number them here. So 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, A, B, C, D, E, F. You could also write 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. I don't care. I'm just using that to, because I wanted to only put one thing. All right, so the first one, 1, 2, 3, uh, 1, 2, 3, 5, 13, 15. Okay, so 1, 2, 3, 5, 13, and 15. The next one is 0, 2, 4, 6. So 0, 2, 4, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. And then 2, 5, 9, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and then 13, 14, 15. So 15, 14, 13. And then um, the last one, 6, 7, 13, 15. So 6, 7, 13, 15. 15 and 13. Our D, DF, if you will. Okay, now, <clears throat> what we're supposed to do then is, is how do you hook this up to the ROM? Well, the first thing is, here are your independent variables, A, B, C, D. But it's important to notice that the way we've done the truth table, A is our high order, and D is our low order variable. And this is the same on the truth table. Our rows are addressed... A3210. So so A is the higher order variable. A2, A3, A2 is the next, A1, and then A0 is the lower order. So we want to have A connected to A3, B connected to A2, C connected to A1, and D connected to the lower order variable A0. Then we also want to know how to identify our outputs. Well, let's go ahead and put 
let's put F1 in this column, F2 in this column, F3 in this column, and F4 over here. So then these outputs would just be F1, F2, F3, and F4. But you do have to specify how you're going to have this connected. You can't just leave it uh, uncertain and then give this uh, assignment off to a technician to solder the thing up. Uh, clearly, there's no way they're going to get it right if you don't give them, uh, tell them how to connect it. And now, what about the information? Well, we just take this information just like it is, and we can map it right over here. And we can do that because we preserve the order of precedence of our independent variables, and we use the same column assignments as we had in the truth table. So it's really easy. So we just go, we just, so in this row, we just do one, one, space one, and then one space one. Here we just do uh, uh, zero, two, four, six. And then we do what? Um, that was uh, nine and 11. So 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, nine, and so forth. We just copy the rest of the things in. This one, we just have six and seven. So zero, one, two, three, four, five, six and seven and then we have f f we have a uh, ff or f uh, 15 and um, 13 and this one we just have um, what two five so zero one two three four five and then nine five six seven eight nine and 10, 11, 12, 13. 10, 11, 12. Um, 13, 14, 15, right? Yeah, 13, 14, 15. And so there's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Okay, yeah. So that's right. Now notice... There is no simplification involved. I just, all I did was label the outputs to match the functions, the, way, the order in the truth table, and to match the independent variables lined up with their, with their order, highest order with uh, address line three, lowest order with address line zero. And now I just copy the contents directly into here. I didn't put the zeros. Obviously, in the real world, you do have to put the zeros in. Uh, you have to set each bit as a zero or a one. So you would want to specify zeros and ones. But for sake of clarity, I didn't put the zeros. And then how many bits does this ROM have? Well, it's got four columns, and each column has 16 bits. So that's 4 times 16, or 64. Okay, so that takes care of that one. And now let's do the last, uh, last page. Um, the first problem is this flip-flop. So how would you turn this uh, into a D flip-flop? Well, if you'll remember, the way to do the D flip-flop is we have to connect an inverter. Into, a, into the JK input. And um, what kind of clock? Well, notice that this clock has a bubble on it. So that makes it a falling edge clock. Since it's also got the little care here that makes it an edge clock. Does this flip-flop has a set input shown? It has a asynchronous clear, but no set. So the answer is no. Is the asynchronous clear active high or low? Well, since there's no bubble, It is active high. All right. Then for the switching function, uh, show how to draw it with uh, two layers using um, just regular and, OR and AND gates. So you have two input OR gates. This one has A, B, C, and D. And you have another one. 
with A prime, B prime, C and D. And then these both go into an AND gate. And now comes your now comes your G. Now if you have to do it in two layers, we're going to have to break these up because we can only have um, two inputs maximum on our gates. So when we break them up, uh, we're going to have an OR gate. We're going to have an OR gate. And then we'll put those into another OR gate. And then we'll have an OR gate here and an OR gate here. We'll put those into another OR gate. And then we'll put these into an AND gate for our output F. So this one will just be A, B, C, D, A prime, B prime, C, D. And That'll give us the F that we want. Now, if these were NAND gates, remember our NOR gates, we'd have to put inverters in between them or use an extra NAND gate as an inverter to make that work. Uh, so I might give you that. Um, and I'll, I'll review that again before uh, we get to the test. We have a good couple weeks for the test. In dealing with hazards, check true or false with the following statements. In deciding whether a hazard is a problem, you must consider the downstream logic. Yes. The downstream logic is some kind of something like a mechanical bell. Uh, in a few nanoseconds, it's not going to do anything. So that's that's totally fine. You can ignore hazards there. If, on the other hand, it's a system, a high-speed computing system, to do something like uh, launch a rocket or something, well, then you might very well need to deal with the hazard. Uh, in deciding uh, the standard approach I taught to fix hazard is to add an essential prime implicant. No, essential prime implicants are always required in your minimum solution. What you add is a consensus term, so that's false. If all gates had zero propagation delay, there would not be hazards. Yes, that's pretty much true. If there, were, if, if there weren't delays, then hazards wouldn't exist. A consensus term can fix a hazard because the variable that changes to cause a hazard is not in the consensus term. That's exactly correct. That's why it works. Okay, given this code, A, B, A ended with B after C and C after 10 nanoseconds. So basically that gives us a NAND gate, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, an AND gate rather, with A, B, C. And it has a delay of 10 nanoseconds. And then we have a, we have, uh, and that output is E. Then we have an or, or, we have X or not y after 10. So we have x going into um, an OR gate, and we have y prime. Or if you wanted to put an inverter, you could. And it has 10 nanosecond delay. And then finally, and the output from this one is f. Finally, E and F and Z after 5 nanoseconds all end together. So we make another AND gate here. And we have Z. So Z goes in here. We have F and it goes in there. And we have E that goes in there. And obviously, uh, then our output here would be H. Okay. Draw the circuit. So there's my circuit. If A equals 0, what's output H? Well, so if A equals 0, I know this is 0. And if this is 0, I know this is 0. doesn't matter anything else. Because that's an AND gate. All the inputs have to be 1 for this to output a 1. Otherwise, it's going to output a 0. If Z is 0, so if A is 0, what is output H? H equals 0. If Z is 0, that also, if Z is 0, that guarantees you that H is going to equal 0. Okay, that's that for that one. And then for 
for f, use a k-map to find all the min terms, write the shorthand notation. Okay, so so we just plot these, and then that shows us all the min terms. Now, what you have to remember is there may be some of these some of these uh, some of these uh, expressions might have overlaps. So let's do AC first. Well, let me try the. So this is A. This is B. This is C. And this is D. This just helps me a lot. Okay, the first one is AC. All of A, all of C. So that's ones here. Always going to plot ones. And then the next term is B, D, C prime. So B, B would be these two columns here. C, uh, B, D, C prime. Yeah, so that's B. D, on the other hand, are these middle four. And C prime, then, is just where C is not. So that's up there. So it looks like, looks like that's a little bit hot. All right, so yeah, that's good. Okay, so that's, that's B, D, C prime. And then A prime, B prime, C prime. So A prime is these two columns. B prime is this whole column. And C prime are these two boxes up there. So in this case, none of these terms did overlap. Uh, they were all, they all had their nice, they were all nice and cleanly separate. Now we can read off the min terms. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, so that's 13, 14, 15, 14, 15. That reads them off. Okay, <clears throat> and then here, we're just going to double invert this. So because we want nan nan, we know we have to be in uh, SOP form. If we wanted to be nor nor, we'd have to be in POS. But in this case, we're in the right form. So now we just do in one, two inversions. Invert, invert. Now we just take this one and we apply it in here. But we don't apply it. We, we let these just represent sort of variables. We put parentheses around them. And so what we wind up with is BC in parentheses, tick. So we're going to invert the whole thing. And then we do have to change these to dots. So times A prime C prime D quantity inverted times BD prime quantity inverted. And that equals, that's now in, uh, we, we still have the big outside parenthesis we didn't mess with. That's got a tick on it. And that looks like that is now in NAND, NAND form. Because notice that term there is a, is a NAND term. And that term there is an AND term. And that term there is an AND term. All right, one last problem to do. And that is this flip-flop, okay? And so the first thing we do is we read the problem. Using the JK flip-flop picture, write in the tracing for Q in the timing diagram. Assume that the time for the output to change after the active edge of the clock is 10 nanoseconds. Assume setup and hold times can be ignored and that Q equals 1 at T equals 0. So Q starts off as 1, so that's good to know. I screwed that up when I worked it this morning. I didn't realize that. I didn't read the problem carefully. And notice I bolded it and underlined it. But I still misread it. Okay, the first thing we do is look at the look at this. First of all, does this have uh, an asynchronous input? And the answer is no. It does not. It doesn't have a set, and it doesn't have a clear. Now, if we had a set or a clear, that changes things a little bit. And I'll put another test up that has that. And and so that makes it kind of challenging. So if that's the case, we, we first want to determine when is this, this, this has a set. When is this set asserted? It's asserted when set's high. So here's our set line. Where is high? It's high right here. So I color in, I hatch in these areas. That tells me that in those areas, my clock will not have an effect. And so now when I go through and I highlight my clock edge, now here, this is a rising edge or a falling edge. It's a falling edge. So what I would do is I would highlight 
I would highlight all my clock edges that I'm interested in. Uh, maybe I have a maybe I have a better color. So I'm going to go through and I'm going to highlight the falling edges. These are the falling edges. But I know that I shouldn't highlight the ones where my asynchronous input is active. So I'll kind of take these out because they're not going to have any effect there. So now I only have those edges to deal with. Okay, but in this problem, I... I, I don't have any asynchronous inputs, so I'm going to highlight all my rising edges. And now, uh, now at each rising edge, I know that the actual effect, now these aren't lined up exactly on the lines, so I know that the, the actual uh, effect is going to be delayed just a little bit. It's going to be delayed 10 nanoseconds. So each of these ticks is 10 is 10 nanoseconds. So I know that I'm actually not going to have anything happen until right here. All right. But I'm curious, but I really want to know what my inputs are right here. So the first thing I do is I look at my J and K inputs. Now, let's mark them and then we'll look and see what we have to do. Okay, so here, J is 0, but K is 1, okay? Then if we go to the next one, okay, so I'll draw a line right here. There's my clock edge, but 10 nanoseconds later is going to be right here. So I'll go ahead and, and mark that in. That's where the effect's going to take place. And at this point... J is 1, and K is 1, okay? And then I check it again here. And I'll put in my, my 10 nanosecond delay. We'll do the same thing here. Put in my 10 nanosecond delay here. And then same thing here. And put in my 10 nanosecond delay here. And same thing here. And put in my 10 nanosecond delay here. All right, now, now we've got this all set up. Should be a piece of cake to finish it up. So here, uh, they're one and one again. Here, my J is one and my K is zero. Here, my J is zero and my K is one. And here, my J is 1 and my K is 0. All right. Now, we do have to remember the rule. What is the rule? Well, the rule is that um, we have to think of J, K, and our, and our Q plus. Okay, so if they're both 0, we're going to hold. If J is 0 and K is 1, it's going to clear. So it's going to go to 0. If J is 1 and K is 0, it's going to set to 1, regardless of what it is now. And if they're both 1, it's going to toggle. So for these situations, you don't need to know the present state because you know it's going to go to 0 or 1. In, this, in these two situations, you do need to know the present state. 
because in this one it's going to be the same thing and in this one it's going to flip so you do have to pay attention to that all right in this case we have a j is zero and a k is one so that's this situation here it's going to go to zero let's see let's get so you can see everything okay that looks pretty good all right so that means we're going to go here but we're not going to change where the clock edge is we have to wait the 10 nanoseconds and now we're going to go down to zero now we know we're going to stay down at least until this next line we might continue to stay down but we can't change until here at the clock edge it's one and one so we're going to toggle toggle means we flip so we're going to go to one now we go to here there's still one one so we're going to toggle back to zero now we go to here. Here, J is 1 and K is 0, so that means we're going to set. So we go up. We set. We stay set to here. Now J is 1 and K is 0, so that means we're going to go to 0. We, we continue to here. Now J is 1 and K is 0, so we're going to set again. And we're going to go on off the page. So we're basically toggling every single time. Now that is unusual. Uh, I didn't even remember doing this test. Maybe maybe I just made that up. I don't know. But anyway, that's that. Let me just go through one other test. I, I will make this visible so you can see it. I showed it to you just a second ago. But um, uh, it's, on, it's on Blackboard. So it has a different problem here. Now here it has the, the decoder, the 3 to 1 decoder. And so I, remember, the chip select has to go to ground you have to put your independent variables in the correct order into the control lines. High order variable X goes with high order control line A and so forth. And then you select one of your eight control lines. Since we have 0, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 7, we have to connect 0, 2, 5, and 7 to an OR gate to give us our desired output. Uh, in this one, let's look at it for a second. Um, so when you look at these two, um, which is going to be your simpler form? Your SOP or your POS? Well, you've got a group of four here and a group of four there. You don't need this other group of four. That's a consensus term. So you have two, two variable terms. Here you have two groups of four for the zeros, and you have two, two variable terms. So POS equals SOP. So there's really, so doesn't matter, either one, they're the same. But in this one, I just ask you to give me the POS form. So the POS form, you take off this. If this were uh, a min term, then you'd say this would be uh, BC prime, but it's going to be B prime. B prime plus C, and if these were min terms, that would be A prime, A prime C, but it's that therefore it's going to be A plus C prime. So that's the answer: A plus C prime times B prime plus C, because you were re requested to do the POS solution. I can't tell you how many on this test a bunch of students put the. SOP solution for some crazy reason. Even though they're equivalent, they're not the same. And notice here, uh, so the POS solution is this. The SOP solution is going to be uh, uh, is going to be uh, uh, B prime C prime plus down here AC. So notice. These are these are these are exactly equal to each other because you can use the M and F, and you can do this, uh, and and this, and you can get that will be uh, C plus or I should say B prime plus C quantity times uh, A plus C prime. Oh son of a gun! Those are exactly the same. Notice that the POS and SOP solutions are not the inverse of each other they're the exact uh, they're the exact they're, they're just the they're ones in SOP form and ones in POS uh, if you inverted say either one of these solutions if you inverted this one 
you'd get a prime c times b c prime. Well, that's not what that's not what this is. This is a c uh, times b prime c prime. So they're very different, and and that's important to remember. Remember the correct solutions in POS form and SOP form equal each other. They're not the inverse. Okay, so that's pretty much the whole test. Uh, this test for the uh, decoder is pretty straightforward. You just have to connect the desired outputs. In this case, 0, 2, 5, and 7. The rest of them you just leave disconnected. You don't connect them. I, in every test, I'll have a bunch of students that will put them all, every single output, into the same OR gate. Well, that just gives you a 1. F will always be 1. So that's not desirable. And it's good to remember to hook up the chip select. You have to set that to ground to turn on the chip because it's active low. And uh, I can't think. Here's a D flip flop. Anyway, I'll make this test visible and you can you can look at this on the on the web. All right. So so that's pretty much what I wanted to cover. Let me switch my thing back over here. And I'll blow my screen up a little bit. Uh, Okay, so that's pretty much what I wanted to cover. Uh, I'll go ahead and post this video. It's, um, it's 46 minutes, so that's plenty good. And then I will also uh, I'll just do a little teeny quiz associated with it. I may only ask you a couple of questions because, you, you know, I wanted you to do the test. Um, so, um, yeah. All right, that'll do it. And there's my granddaughter in the background. Hi, All right. Papa. Hi, sweetie. All right, we'll talk to you later. Girl, I'm a good girl. Good.